Now I'm going to show just uh, the seeding sequence of what actually happens just in a little area here as an example. So this is just an overgrown arugula patch from, uh, it was an arugula seed crop that went to flower and uh, just rank excessive growth. So we're going to eliminate this. So we mowed it down with the mowing machine and this is morning, one morning, probably July here, got the beets next to it there. We covered it that morning and this is what it looked like 24 hours later. And so again, you know, the beets did shade a little area there and instead of leaving the cover on for two days to solarize that little edge by the beets, we will simply just hoe that off. Again, we, we, we like it to go fast. We don't want to leave the covers on for too long, so we don't mind hitting a little something here or there with a hoe. But, uh, and, you know, obviously shade works against you on something like that. So that's a 24-hour period, and then we immediately are uh, reseeding that bed area. So it's very, very fast moving. So it goes from one crop into another, often in a 24-hour period. And we do that for a number of reasons. It's to maximize our production, of course, especially on this field here where it's year-round vegetable production, uh, so that it, there's never a break for more than 24 hours so that the soil microbiology is being constantly fed because there's two means to really feed the soil microbiology and that is with growing vegetation which is of course fixing the solar energy into uh, sugars and other materials that the plant can exude and then feed the soil microbiology or you have the opportunity to feed the soil microbiology decaying organic materials and minerals on, in this case on the soil surface and the microbes are uh, able to incorporate both those things. So we do both of those things extensively and as much as possible all the time. And so that means keeping constant vegetative cover over every piece of land for uh, as much time as possible and very short breaks in between one crop into another. So mycorrhizal fungus, for instance, will not live, reportedly anyway, for very long uh, without a host. So by having only a 24-hour break before there's a new seed in the ground or a transplant uh, sending in new roots into the ground, uh, mycorrhizal has the potential, fungus has the potential to continue its growth. I mean, granted, it could go into a spore format and then uh, regenerate itself, but we try to keep the whole biology moving. They're used to a diet of photosynthesis, uh, uh, products being pumped into the soil, we don't want to switch that off and just move into decomposition organisms. We want to keep those organisms that feed on the rhizosphere type of activities as well fed as much as possible. So that's why uh, that very quick moving system is developed. And we also like in the previous pictures how close the microbiology can also, if you're only solarizing small areas in this case, you know, you, the microbiology can, can still move in from the sides readily. So we don't, we will gr gladly work little strips. You know, obviously we do bigger areas too. Uh, but, you know, this kind of intermingling, I like the trees on the borders. Those tree roots are into the fields and they're supporting mycorrhizal organisms because they're still alive and they have their roots into the field. And yet, you know, the crop is not stunted by the presence of tree roots and they have a symbiotic relationship with the trees instead of a uh, competitive nature. So that is, that's why a lot of things look the way they do. You know, we used to go for neat and tidy and now it looks much more wild and overgrown. I, I intentionally try not to mow the field edges before absolutely necessary to keep as much uh, microbiology fed, to keep uh, beneficial insects fed, and keep the functioning system as whole as possible. This field is on a 36 inch bed with an eight inch wheel track, which is the size of the cub tractors. Uh, and that's for very intensive production. This is the year round field. We do an acre of low tunnels. I'll talk about that in the next lecture. And the low tunnel works well on a 36 inch bedding system and the cub tractors fit on that system. And then on the other fields, we work a 58 inch bed uh, with a 10 inch wheel track, which fits the super C tractor and it, the Super C is also able to, when we used to have to chisel plow or something in these fields to chisel plow, uh, the Super C can fit over a two bed, two bed system here, the tires would kick out. So it's a mixture of two tractors mixed with uh, 
a uh, different appropriate bedding system. But the, the, the bottom line is the wheel tracks and walkway areas are incredibly small, and that is to maximize uh, yield per area, but also to maximize uh, photosynthesis in the area. So I'm going to get into compost application now because uh, we're into the seeding sequence. So I'm going to discuss exactly how we get crops seeded or transplanted really into the field either. But essentially what we do is I did I now discuss the bedding system with you. So this field here it, with the 36 inch beds is uh, very uh, uh, it's difficult to get machinery in. It's very uh, closely spaced. And so we do have a dump cart on one of the uh, Super C tractors, or no, Cub tractors, so that it can pull out, or I can load into loader, compost, dump cart, drive the tractor out over the field and dump spread using the little uh, Cub tractor. However, it is actually faster simply to load the bucket of the tractor, line up three wheelbarrows, dump into three wheelbarrows, and shoot the wheelbarrows down the walkways and dump spread using the wheelbarrows and trying to turn the cub around and move it back and forth down the... Uh, so we never lift compost. We only dump it out and spread compost, you know. So we've, we spread probably easily 30 tons to an acre a year, probably more. So we're, we're, we're spreading 100 tons of material uh, a year. And we, but we never lift any of it. Now, on the 58 inch bed, inch beds, that are actually a couple miles down the road. Uh, we load a, a dump truck, which is a single tire uh, rear end, uh, which fits over the 58 inch bed with the 10 inch wheel track, roughly. They might be 12 inch tires, but you know, they go down a, a 10 inch wheel track pretty darn well. And we pull the dump truck, we load the dump truck at this field, because all the compost is made at this field, drive it two miles down the road, and dump spread out of a dump truck onto those uh, beds in those fields. Now, we do have a manure spreader that fits over the 58-inch bed, and I would use the maneuver, manure spreader over the dump truck, but coordinating the delivery of the compost from this site two miles down the road, uh, it's too slow to, to move the manure spreader that far, so we just go with straight dump truck uh, dump spread and rake out instead. If I had compost built at those fields, I would load it into manure spreader and just take the manure spreader over the field. But, uh, so that's how we deliver all of this compost onto the beds. This is an example of compost application onto the bed surface. This is uh, uh, early on when we were first switching into no-till, so probably one of the first years, and this is a heavy application of compost. And so when we first switched into no-till and we had uh, numerous weed seeds in the soil from previous years of annual crop production, we had to smother essentially uh, that weed seed bank for the first couple of years by applying you know, an inch to two inches of compost to the bed surface initially. And although that might seem daunting when I talk about compost and how easy it is to manufacture this compost, it might seem a little less daunting. But just so you know, uh, if you need to smother out an existing weed seed bank and you're moving into no-till from a weedy, annual weedy field, you know, that's how we approached it. It was an initial heavy application for the first couple years. Now, when we plowed in sod, and, which was a perennial and cleaned up the perennials, we didn't need to do anything like that. We just did a, a regular, much lighter compost application regularly, but we did use compost initially to smother out our weed seed bank. And uh, so, you know, that was just spread with comp uh, wheelbarrows moving down. Potassium levels in phosphorus with straw and compost. Should we talk about that now or in the compost and nutrient balance? Yeah. Okay, um. so <laughs> what, what test are they using to determine this? You have to use the modified Morgan. Modified um, Morgan. Um, All right, so let me jump on soil but testing. Say that to farmers here that if they're, and if you I'm sorry that, you to hear that, you guys. That's uh, the, the, the regulation. It's an animal based compost, really. Oh, possibly. All right, so let me. Uh, well, let me jump on. Oh, that's. Uh, I'm going to talk sorry. about fertility and a lot, but I might as well hit that since it's a hot subject up here. Uh, 
regulators are terrible. They don't understand anything. They don't understand organic farming systems. They make terrible rules. They, they are not in the field. They don't understand what's going on. Their tests are flawed. So the, those strong acid extracts of uh, soils will always give you a strong uh, phosphorus extract. But you go and take yourself a saturated paste or a weak acid or a Lamat, and you test those exact same soils, and you're not going to get any phosphorus out of that soil. This phosphorus is totally immobilized in organic systems. It's extremely difficult to get phosphorus mobilized and into living systems or get it to move anywhere. It's one of the most inert. Uh, that's the whole problem with phosphorus is how inert it is and how to get it moving in agricultural. What's that? It can run off in a road, and that's been the problem. Oh, yeah. I mean, a manure can run off a road, and sure, you know, septic tanks, you know, liquid manures, all right. But, I mean, when we're talking about uh, organic vegetable fields and getting phosphorus available in, into the system is extremely difficult. It's extremely hard to get that material. So, despite it, the, those strong acid extracts are terribly inaccurate on whether phosphorus is actually available into your crop or not. I would strongly recommend, if you're using soil testing to determine nutrient needs, to go with a very weak acid extract and really see what's happening. The weak acid extracts have every time lined up with our tissue analysis with uh, the universities when we actually measure phosphorus and calciums and, and uh, in our in our leaves, it is the the tests. It's 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 so difficult to get those things high enough in our tissues, and the 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 weak acid extracts are saying exactly the same thing. The strong acid extracts are always telling us too much phosphorus, too much calcium. Well, maybe there's too much phosphorus and too much calcium if you've got a really strong acid, but it's not getting into the plant and. Uh, so for soil testing, we run a double acid extract with Crop Services International, and they're in Wisconsin. And so what they do over there is they run on the same soil, they'll run you a Melic 3 test, which is a strong acid extraction, and a weak acid extraction, which I believe is a Lamott, maybe it's Morgan, Morgan Lamott, something very weak. And so it, it, it gives you an idea of the Melic 3 is going to give you an idea of, let's just take calcium. So say your Melic 3 comes back with a high calcium level. And then the weak acid extract comes back with a, with a low calcium levels. Under that scenario, what that's pointing to is that there is calcium in the soil. Melic 3 picked it up, but it probably isn't getting into your plant that well. And so the weak acid extract uh, kind of signals better plant availability. And under those conditions, what that would say is increase your biological activity to get a better calcium release and go with small applications of calcium fertilizer in order to move things along just kind of steady and slow. Now, if Melic 3 came back with a low calcium level, you know you need to add more calcium to the soil. However, we combined those tests with tissue analysis up at our university, UConn, and so we'll run tissue analysis, and we run a good amount of tissue analysis in the field, and we use tissue analysis to, well, we, we, try, we, we use it on general crops just to line it up with the soil analysis, and it is very interesting to see that the tissue analysis lines up very well with the weak acid extract. Getting back to the unfortunate situation that you guys have up here, which I was not aware of, uh, uh, let me save more phosphorus and potassium talk for later. But uh, yeah, you're gonna, you guys are going to have to finagle your way. I'm sure you guys will finagle your way however you can, because of course farmers were excellent at dodging regulators. <laughs> okay, so let's get on with this business. We can talk more about nutrient balancing and stuff later on. Uh, so uh, when it comes time to seed a crop, uh, what we've got is, so we've got a composted bed surface or not. So this is an example, it's not a great picture, but this is an attempt to show a germinating uh, crop here. Mix, this is an 
uncomposted bed surface, and this is a bed surface that is composted and now is being seeded. And so, uh, the well, I think it's just bad photography, really, but they're all minerals do run through the composting system, so the compost can, including uh, rock dust and things like that, uh, quarry dust, are in the compost, but I really think that's just kind of like off photography. It's too, picture is too light for some reason there. Uh, so the, the, when, so now the, comp, the seed is applied to the bedding surface. So this example of direct seeding onto a bedding surface. So we, on the back of your handout is all the seeding rates that we essentially use. And it is volume of seed per area. So when we need to seed a 120 foot bed with lettuces, which are at one sixth of a fluid ounce per 10 feet, uh, that's gonna give us two fluid ounces of seed to a 120 foot bed. So we put two fluid ounces of seed into that measuring cup there. And we will start walking down the row on one side and we will distribute the seed over the bed surface. So when I get halfway down one side, which is a quarter of the way, I've got an ounce and a half of seed left. When I'm halfway down, I get an ounce of seed coming back to the other side. So I measure how much seed's getting laid out by volume over this area planted. And so broadcast seeding is very freeing. So because there's no weeds, you can just toss seeds onto the surface, work them into the soil, cover them over, irrigate them, and germinate them. And we do tremendous amounts of seeding just by tossing the seeds onto the bed surface. Uh, and also in this system is extreme ability to interseed crops and interseed cover crops because you're never tangling with weeds. So it really frees you up into what you can do and what you, uh, your potential for you know, mixing different crop species and uh, it's a very freeing system. So if the seed is large, like a cilantro seed or something, we will work it into the soil using a garden weasel or a rolling cultivator-like tool like this to churn the soils about and work that seed into uh, the soil. Uh, but generally, and that's a warren hoe for ripping furrows through the soil, Generally the tool, and I'll get a close up of this, that we use to work the seed into the soil is a chain drag, which is a dragging tool to churn the compost soil crop residues about and uh, to get the seed worked into the soil surface, whether it has compost or like the other bed, just straight onto crop residue. Now on the seeding chart is you know, there's variables with volume seeding per area, like for instance, beet seeds. There can be a lot of different size beet seeds or a lot of different size carrot seeds or, so, or spinach seed. So you do have to pay attention to seed size with those numbers. Obviously, if they're really big seeds, there's gonna be less plants per area. And the, some other variables you need to consider, of course, time of year. If you're seeding spinach in August, it does not germinate nearly as well as if you're seeding spinach in October. Uh, so you have to, you know, vary your seeding rates according to various conditions. Are you seeding on top of compost, for instance? Seeding into compost, you get great uh, results. But however, if you're seeding just on top of crop residue, you might need to increase your seed rate under those conditions. So though I provided you with a lot of numbers there, certainly there's variables to consider when you're, when you're working with those numbers. But they're, they're pretty good and enough to get you started with. They tend to, to be too dense for us than too light in general. But again, under different systems, you might find that different things are uh, appropriate. So here are the tools that we use to work the seed into the bed surface. So we have scattered seed onto the bed surface. So we will now, the tool of choice is this ring drag here, which is the easiest, fastest tool. Obviously, we could mount one onto a tractor if we wanted to. Those are the individual gangs they're all hooked to a wooden bar. The individual ga gangs are actually uh, grain drill ring drags. They usually go behind a grain drill. And I provide you the contact information where to purchase them. They're like three or four dollars for a, a group. And so we just ganged them together on a wooden bar and uh, 
put a put a handle on it, and that's how we drag most of the seed. It turns it about. It, depending on how you hold it, you get various action, one, two, or three groups of rings. Uh, however, the much more easy access tool for doing about the same thing is to take a leaf rake and just straighten out all the tines and uh, so that it just works the surface of the soil. With, and obviously, you need more passes because it's narrower and things like that. But that does a similar, very similar churning activity. And as I mentioned, if it's a large seed and we really want to churn it into the crop residue or compost, then we do come in with a rolling cultivator for like a beet or a cilantro, sometimes something like spinach, but you know, the larger kind of seeds. Uh, we still, and well, and then of course there's the roller. And rollers always increase seed to soil contact. So any of those tools, if then you rolled, would give you even better germination. However, we rarely use the roller because we do fine just dragging it with the ring drag and the little seeds germinate great. So rarely do we actually get a roller out. But it would slightly increase probably any method with the germination. The, where we use the roller mostly is, as you'll see, we'll, there's a lot of residues and mulches used in the system. And if we're growing something like mosh, uh, which needs to be cut really low, or even a lot of salad greens really, uh, will roll the actual crop residues and mulches in order to get us a, a lower the ability to cut lower of these leafy greens in the field. So, but those are some basic, some real basic options to get the seed worked into that soil surface. And there's uh, another picture of the ring drag. So you can see they're individual gangs and that's, it's a superior implement compared to a chain link fence, for instance, where a chain link fence is connected to itself on the side as well. This allows each individual gang to ride up and down over residues, so it, they're all moving at different heights and back and forth, so it really does a good job of mixing the soil surface. However, there's no reason not to still use a seeder. Uh, we choose to broadcast the seeds because it's quick and efficient and gives us maximum uh, surface coverage. However, this is a trial just, I just demonstrated. So this bed surface, you know, it's a pinpoint seeder, so I did have to rake this bed surface and I actually rolled it first to get it a little nicer because there was more crop residue and a pinpoint seeder isn't particularly tolerant of residues. But here is the same thing, just a little more finesse in bed prep and then a pinpoint seeder run down with an arugula crop. And here is the earthway seeder with much less finesse uh, with bed prep. I don't think I actually did any bed, you know, I just, this is the surface of the bed and I ran the earthway down it. Uh, and you know, there's a couple skips here and there, but it's gonna be a fine stand of arugula in the end with no additional bed prep, but using the uh, earthway seeder. And this is the same exact bed, just broadcast seeded. In, in the end, they all filled out and were a perfectly reasonable arugula crop, no matter which method we utilized. So, but the important thing to remember is that, or the technique you might want to utilize is if it's your first year coming out of a tilled field with annual weeds in it, you might be better off still seeding in rows with your seeding equipment so that you can still hoe because obviously you can't hoe if you're broadcast seeding. So, you know, if you want, right in the conversion period, you know, you might, as you're experimenting and working with it, you might still want to run rows, even though you're going to have some residue in there, it's going to make hoeing diff more difficult than usual. You can still get a hoe into, into, whoops, wrong way. We could still get a hoe into that if we needed to. You know, obviously it's not as easy as a real clean bed, but uh, it would be hoeable. Or in, or in the pinpoint one as well. So uh, that is an approach. We still seed certain crops in rows, like our sweet corn, you know, is always in a row. Our pole beans are in rows. Uh, uh, our winter squash is in rows. And in the case of those where we're seeding very large seeds with the seeder, uh, we actually rip a furrow first with a hoe or with a shovel on a tractor 
uh, on the cultivating frame, and we actually, the first pass is, you know, you rip the furrow with a tool, and then you run the seeder down the furrow for a large seeded crop. So we still do that kind of thing. Uh, you know, it takes an additional pass with whatever tool, but it's uh, for our limited amount of seeding that we do, that's uh, more than economic for us. So this is a bale shredder, gasoline powered, uh, square, bale, square bale shredder, and there's a tractor mounted uh, bale shredder that we get large bales and we feed uh, just slabs of thousand pounders through the big uh, PTO driven shredder. And that gives us our shredded straw. They both work with sickle bar blades. That's actually a shredded hay we used to utilize. Uh, very nice material, well, straw. Hay, too many weed seeds, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but essentially what we do is, as soon as the crop is seeded, we immediately irrigate it. And generally, that is the only irrigation event that ever happens to the crop because of the aforementioned benefits of water management in the no-till system. So the mulch surface uh, covers the, the seed and the compost, which compost is largely a biological inoculant. And so it would be very detrimental to take your compost out to a field toss it on the bed surface, and leave it to fry in the sun. What, you, what we need to do, and that's part of why the system is so quickly moving, <coughs> is that the, uh, the compost, you know, the bed surface is exposed. We want to cover it as quickly as possible after mowing and solarizing. We compost it, we seed it, and then we mulch it, and we water it all within a period of a few hours. So we never want our compost or our bed surface to dry out. So the, uh, the, this irrigation event is very useful for hydrating a thin layer of mulch that is applied over the seed, as well as watering in the compost and biological inoculant, which we actually do, I'll talk about a little bit about our biological inoculant that we also apply during the composting phase. So that is a very important event, event you can put uh, crop stimulating nutrients into the initial irrigation water. Those would be things like sea salt and seaweed, liquid seaweeds. You could, I mean, there's other things too that you could utilize, but uh, those are a, cu a couple of really good ones, the trace elements of the seawater and uh, the growth, increasing growth factors of a liquid seaweed can be really useful in that initial application. So, however, then the mulch is hydrated and keeps moisture in that uh, seed area for germination of your seedlings. So it's very useful. It requires less water, of course, to water before mulching. So if you're under a limited water scenario, uh, you can certainly water first and then mulch over the top. But it, it and, you know, and the mulch will help maintain the water that you just applied. But it is preferable to uh, be able to apply water on top of the mulch and saturate that if there's not imminent rain coming, of course. Let me talk about mulch materials now. Okay, so that's just germination through a mulch there. And a lot of these pictures are old. I believe this is probably a hay straw mixture there. We, as I said, we don't use hay at this point at all. So, but let me talk about what we do use. Oh, maybe I have a, really this is more like what we utilize now, which is a, a mixture of wood chip, leaf, and straw. Those are our three main mulch materials that we utilize. And we like to utilize all three of them at the same time. So that is a diversity of foods for the microbes. And uh, so the materials are generally clean. Uh, trees and tree matter is some of the cleanest materials that you can get into uh, our agricultural systems. Trees, you know, generally not real tolerant of heavy herbicide usage, known to be, re in, in, in the composting world, tree residues, some of the cleanest we can get because there's a lot of contaminants out there, of course. And so uh, we get wood, chips, and leaves delivered into the farm. 
The chipping can come from roadside chipping. It's usually hardwoods. There's some softwoods mixed in sometimes. Uh, some tree companies do chipping and things like that. So we've got pretty good access to the wood chips down our way. And a leaf comes in largely from landscapers who do leaf cleanups of various uh, places and facilities in the fall. And all the better if they run their suction ma machines that they suck up the leaves with, generally tend to chop the leaf, but all the better if they ran them over with their mowing machines, sucked them up and then sucked them into their truck because that is a beautiful material, uh, a double chopped leaf coming in. Uh, Another option is to simply take the partially chopped leaves and let them sit for a few years and they will decompose into <laughs> fragments. Or they can be utilized sparingly as long as they don't mat in the field when you are applying them. But the mixture of the materials tends to keep them from matting, being able to mix the wood chip and the leaf and the straw together. The straw is generally chopped. So lately we've been getting barley straw in which it hasn't required chopping because it's got shorter stems and it's easier to work with. Uh, so, and we can run, we can run leaf through the choppers with the straw if we want to really chop them up and mix them together. However, I'm always cautious about dulling the blades of the chopping machines with junk that is in the leaf, like stones, wood. It's not the greatest to run through your through your uh, straw chopper. So, but generally we mix those things up and we apply them to the surface of the bed relatively thin, just so you just can't see the soil surface. So just enough to cover the soil surface because you don't want to inhibit the seed germination. And you'll get an eye for that, how much to lay down. And if you're going to inhibit, you, know, you can always go out there and check, move things around. Obviously something like a potato or something, you can lay a lot of the material down several inches and a potato will shoot up through it. But for all little seeds and stuff, just a, just a single layer of the, of the mixed material. Now, what happens, oh, let me talk about straw. I didn't talk about straw quality. There's tremendous potential for herbicide contamination in straw crops. So you, you, you really want to know where your straw comes from and have a reliable straw producer. We do have a local fella that grows straw from winter rye just for usage on our vegetable farms. And so that is great material. He cuts it before it gets into seed head at flowering. And uh, it's clean of rye seeds. However, it's not clean of weed seeds because he doesn't have a perfectly clean field that he's growing the rye on. But it's, it's tolerable. But you know, you got to watch weed seeds and grain seeds in straw. So when we, when we get thousand pound bales of barley down from Maine, they are organic and the guy has great weed control. There's, I've never seen a weed in thousands and thousands of pounds of his, of his straw. Uh, however, there's seeds in the barley straw. And so to deal with the seed that is in the straw, we pre-sprout the straws by simply busting apart the bales. We could run them through the shredder, but the barley doesn't even really need shredding. We just spread the bales out in an area and allow the rain or irrigation water to get on the straw. The barley sprouts, and then we, we take the barley straw and we utilize it. And obviously, it kills the barley sprouts when we move the, the straw around. So we pre-sprout the grains in the straw if we're going to utilize it on the field in the summertime or any time where barley would grow. Barley doesn't matter if you're mulching your garlic, you know, it'll grow and then it's going to winter kill. So, you know, you can certainly use it under certain conditions, but we do pre-sprout it if we're going to utilize it uh, for uh, summer type crops. Do we chop the straw? The barley straw has, we have chopped it and it's very nice chopped, but it is short enough fibered that we generally don't really need to chop barley. I mean, we chop the rye, we've chopped wheat, uh, but barley has seemed like we're just, we're just using it as it is at this point. Uh, so that does help speed up some effort too, not having to chop it. Uh, so of course, straw can be contaminated with persistent herbicides if you don't get a reputable dealer. They pass right through, and, uh, which is also a concern in manure. I'll just talk about persistent herbicides quick because it relates to the compost too. There's a whole class of different herbicides that do not readily break down 
that get applied to grain crops, uh, picloram, aminochloroplerid, maybe you guys have heard of those, and they are the absolute bane of composting systems. They pass through the animals, they pass through the composting system and get out into vegetable fields and do a low level vet, uh, herbicide burn in vegetable crops. So you have to really be careful with both manure sources and straw sources for purity of non-herbicide components. Those three materials that I just said for mulching, the straw, the wood chip, and the leaf are also the whole carbon component of the, carbon, of the composting system that I'll be talking about a little bit later. Oh, great question. Do we use a one-to-one -one proportion? Uh, so it's variable, usually depending on what kind of materials we have. Sometimes we're running out of leaf, we'll go heavier with straw. We generally don't go with straight wood chip, although we have and it works great. Uh, but it really depends on your situation too. Like I was saying earlier, you know, if you don't have enough nitrogen functioning in your system, you probably want to go with the leaf more. And you know, if you've got a lot of nitrogen functioning in your system, by all means dilute with the higher carbon materials like wood chips. So kind of it's like your eyeball. But the veg the field diversity is useful. Like it is very clear. We put chopped leaf, straw, chopped straw, and uh, wood chip out there, and immediately the earthworms suck all that chopped leaf right into their wormholes. It's like within a week to two weeks, it's like you never even put a leaf on the field. They just suck it all right down and it's gone. The fungal organisms move in on that straw, and you'll see all kinds of white fungal growth happening in the straw, and also then gets decomposed second and by the earthworms again as well and the fungus and then the wood chips give us a, a lengthier sustain on the soil surface but even with this biological functioning system even the wood chips break down quick like you know we can get coverage of a soil i mean it would it would cover something like a tomato crop for a full full season but by fall they're going to be gone you know there's not going to be a lot of wood material left on the soil surface. So it's a voraciously hungry field and it constantly requires more feeding all the time. So in, it's a huge out input output. Like we are t removing tremendous volumes of food off the field and we're also applying tremendous amounts of materials to keep the microbiology of the field fed at the same time. So this, uh, we're gonna get into just, uh, just some examples of how the system uh, works. So this is just an example of this is cucumbers coming on to, I believe those are turnips and radishes. Those are ready. There's a, there's a late planting of cucumber. So the cucumbers, the, the turnips and radishes are going to be harvested out. The cucumbers will now spread out over what was covered. And this is just to give you an idea of the intensity of the production, how everything is covered as much as possible all the time. Then the cukes will shoot out under the sweet corn, get into the pole beans there, and this is simply, this is where the sweet corn was growing. I needed some more cress for the salad greens. All I had to do is toss cress seeds onto the soil surface, water them in, and there's just abundant cress underneath the sweet corn. This is just to kind of give you an idea that, that since there's no weeds, you can like do anything you want at any time. So that could have been a cover crop. It could be another crop. Uh, so this is an example of intercropping cover crops. So that's uh, field peas next to eggplants. So the field peas are in between, actually I think that's a pepper and an eggplant, and then an eggplant over there. So the field peas, simply we just crushed them down with our feet and then threw uh, leaf mulch over the top of the field pea to crush it down and smother it. And uh, again, you know, the field peas, there's no weeds in the field peas. We don't have to worry about weeds and just uh, you can intercrop, you can cover crop, you can mix things in. This is cover cropping into, so for cover cropping, what we'll do for like a field that is only in summer crops or fall crops, what we'll do is we'll come in with crimson clover in August, right before a rainstorm, and we'll take 50 pounds to an acre of crimson clover seed, and we will just toss it into the existing uh, growing vegetable crop. Uh, and it starts to germinate in August underneath all the turnips and cabbages and carrots and all that kind of thing. So 50 pounds an acre, crimson clover in August, 
And again, we can do that because we don't have to have a break to control weeds after the vegetable crop is done. We just seed the clover right in. Then we come back with rye, which is germinating there, in September. So we give the clover a jump uh, about a month. And then when there's a rainstorm coming on in September, we come in with 250 pounds to the acre of winter rye and just overseed that right into the growing uh, vegetable crop. So there's the rye started in September, and that's how we got to what I showed you before. Here's some lettuces germinating. All right, so I'm just going to take the next three minutes, and I'm just going to blast right through a whole mess of slides here, just so you can see some other pictures. This is our weed control knife because, you know, since there's no hoeing, so there's pigweed and some uh, parsley, it looks like. My daughter is knifing off the annual weed at soil level. There it is, sliced off. And that way you don't disturb the soil surface. Obviously, we can't really hoe with broadcast seeding. So weed knives is how we control weeds in the field, unless it's a perennial that needs popping out. And like I said, that is tremendously reduced effort over all of our previous efforts. Here's some perennial enemies. Yellow dock, pop out with a trowel. Canada thistle, obviously arc enemy. And uh, got to take care of that. But we have certainly beat that back any place it infested with uh, tenacity or the use of those black plastic tarps over winter. Quack grass, I left this patch growing here just to demonstrate that quack grass used to be an effort to get out of soil, but in a properly aggregated soil like this, you can simply reach into the soil and the quack grass just pulls right out of it because the soil is not a compacted uh, uh, brick. It is a living, breathing, aggregated soil. And the quack, you can just pull, if it starts growing somewhere, you can just literally pull it out uh, Canada, uh, Gallon soga used to be our arc enemy. There were billions of those things growing in our fields. Once we switched into a no-till system, barely do we ever see those things because that's a weed of tillage. And the soil will not uh, signal that to grow. It's not an appropriate uh, growing medium for it any, any longer. There's some hose, which I'm not even going to talk about. We're going to talk about low tunnels. Uh, that's just a small sampling of them. And the next. Uh, pigmentation is one of our quality indicators, and this is not a particularly good indicator, but I have certainly grown purple top turnips that are too nitrogen rich, and they are white with a little bit of purple on them. But a balanced, uh, nit uh, trace mineral rich, uh, high silica soil, tremendous pigmentation also goes along with insect and disease resistance and flavor. Uh, so here's garlic. When we switched into no-till, we started seeing this was always white under a tillage system. Now we started seeing pigmentation and purples and reds. This is years ago too. Uh, you know, we're up to 20,000 of them now. Now they're starting to look more and more like this. They're, they're literally purple at this point under the tillage system, under the high nitrogen uh, from the tillage system, uh, we were getting white garlic. The garlics, 20,000 of them last year we harvested, there was less than five garlics that had stem rot where you reach down and pull the stem off and the garlic stays behind. We used to get three, five percent stem rots in the, in the garlic field, literally less than five out of 20,000. Here's pigmentation of red salad bowl lettuce uh, under a tillage system, high nitrogen. This, I've seen it come out almost green. This is obviously highly pigmented at this point. Here's side by side, uh, no-till. This is an area that we tilled a number of years ago to eliminate quack grass out of this bed. And then we planted a daikon radish, which we can see has a few black rot leaves in it, a little yellow, not a great picture. But there's some yellow leaves in there. It's still a harvestable crop, but you can see uh, this right next to it, not a single leaf with black rot. Same exact field right next to it, same exact fertility, same compost, same exact everything right next to it, uh, showing the difference between tillage and not tillage. Watermelons, when we used to grow these under the tillage system, these vines, these are ripe and ready and we're selling them. Not only are they way bigger than they used to be, those vines are not dead the way they used to be when we grow melons under the tillage system. Uh, live vines at harvest time. <sighs> potatoes, potatoes. Uh, obviously weed free nature of tremendous amounts of crops, tomatoes way less, less foliar diseases, then we used to get garlic already covered, abundant, abundant growth, very tall, parsnips way less canker on the tops of the parsnips, 
basil downy mildew. We've actually, that basil now survives through the summer instead of dying. It does get, still get a little downy mildew on its lower leaves, but we're able to still harvest it through the season. Uh, this is an example of tillage to get rid of uh, uh, weeds in a strawberry, ex strawberry patch, which immediately gave us gallon soga. Like as soon as we touched a field with a tiller, even after years of no-till, we, we rototilled in some uh, strawberries to eliminate some quack grass, planted a kale crop, and whammo, there was gallon soga all over the field again. Uh, direct seeded onions, obviously, oh, this is some good stuff where, see, this is carrots, and the yield of carrots, like hardly any weed control. Carrots are an enormous crop for us at this point. Uh, right next to each other, just, that's just reaching and grabbing just the carrots. I mean, a bushel to three feet and hardly any weed control, just totally delicious, store great uh, uh, winter squashes, kale transplants, arugula, June 4th, wide open, no flea beetles. Uh, June 4th, no till. Uh, all those other amendments and things. I mean, I, I was as shocked as you guys. And well, there's still some flea beetles every once in a while, but this year, not, none. And uh, exactly. Scallions, really close together, tremendous. You can yield tremendous volumes of scallions per area. This is actually a deer fence around the potato and carrot area because the deer over here are much harder to shoot and we're not there to be able to control the deer as much as on the home field. So this simply is eight foot tomato steaks pounded into the ground with uh, a seven foot mesh deer fence material tied to the fence. And to cover about a half an acre with that fence took, you know, a couple of us, no more than, you know, the better part of one morning to set it in place. You know, just pound the stakes in and then start running the deer fence down and just twine it. And we make little uh, pins where we take a, a piece of quarter inch or 3 16th inch metal and round stock and we just bring it up around a pipe, make a bend and set it back down so it's got a pin like and a little handle and it shoves into the ground and you can grab it and pull it out and you don't lose them as easily. So we just pinned it down in between the tomato steaks and that gave us the deer protection for the beets and carrots. Yeah, all right, let's just talk about rodents in general. Essentially, the way everything works in nature is there's you know, that, that old food chain type of scenario. There's always, so when you build up a certain population, there's something that wants to eat that population that's there. Like the deer, we have way too many deer, so all of a sudden there's mountain lions everywhere. And uh, so there, you know, the food source we presented, now there's a massive increase in the mountain lion. So it's the same thing with the rodents. So you've got to make sure that you're not standing in the way of any natural control of the rodent population. So that would be in our area, you know, obviously the birds of prey, the hawks and the, all that kind of thing. Then there is things like weasels and minks. They come up out of the river and they feed on the rodents in our fields. Uh, like my cat brought in a, a least weasel one time. And uh, so we know that they're pre prevalent in our area. And fortunately, the least weasel doesn't really attack chickens too much because we obviously have poultry. Uh, so, you know, we, we let the least weasel go down the rat hole, for instance. But so you want to do everything you can to not stand in the way of natural predation and obviously we maintain cat populations. The number one rodent probably in these fields would be the rat over the mole or the vole or the mouse, but there's not a lot of them and they get under control. You know, we'll smash them. If we see a tunnel, we'll go in there, we'll smash it and we'll club them, we'll stomp them, whatever it takes, you know, just to get rid of anything that's obvious. And that's effective enough in this field that we have very little rodent damage. Uh, however, I really was impressed. Actually, this is a very interesting point that uh, when we switched to no-till, the damage from rodents went way down. And I assume it's because when we previously had been fluffing that soil, that it was very easy for rodents to work through that soil. 
and then all of a sudden, with a, with a regular soil consistency, they were much less prone to dig through the soil. Or so, I do not know exactly what the reason was, but the year that we switched over, and particularly it was noticeable in the potatoes, where normally we would see potato, you know, r rodent tunnels run down the whole line of the hill, you know, snaking through and whatnot, all of a sudden they were all gone. And there was none of this tunnel down the whole row of potato scenario, and our rodent damage dropped away to like nothing at all. It was very interesting, so I'm not sure exactly what happened, if it was a no-till, if other factors had all of a sudden controlled more of the rodents. But beyond that, if uh, on the home front is, you know, in the sheds and things, we'll set mouse trap and things like that to whack mice in the sheds pretty aggressively, usually in the fall when they're on the move, and we'll set rat traps in under the hoop tunnels and things like that if we're getting rats in any of the field areas. So that's the kind of controls that we'll do like ourselves if we have to get into that kind of thing. So slugs, here we go. Okay, so these are cabbages transplanted. And uh, we got some rain after transplanting. And sure enough, this is the lowest area in the field. And you can see the slug damage. They wiped out that little section of cabbage right there, right? And what is, what is very interesting about the slug that I have noticed, and I'm sure you all have too, that they exactly mimic the soil topo topography to the wet zone. So in other words, I know that that little area right there is the wet zone in this field. And the slugs under that rainy condition wiped out exactly the profile, and they will do that. You know, I've seen it numerous times over and over. Granted, that other bed probably should have had a little more wiped out too, but it's right there, this little arc, you know? And so they mimic that soil topography just tremendously accurately. And I've seen it over and over and over again over the years, which leads you to start thinking that, you know, obviously those slugs could have moved off and done it, damaged the other seedlings as well. But is it related to the actual physical condition of the plant in the soil? Okay, it's not a slug mobility problem. You know, the slugs could have moved off and ate this plant here and that plant there, you know. They're related to an environmental condition. You know, in other words, I've seen it so many times where, you know, there's a change in the height of the bed or the, the, the drainage of the bed and the slug damage stops right there. And so slugs I consider to be related to plant physical health. And of course, the plant physical health is particularly challenged under too wet of a condition. But the slugs are responsible for wiping out over lush crops. So in order to control slugs, basically you're working against water, which is the lushness factor in trying to increase sun and, and air, which are constrictive factors in the soil. All right, I'll cover slugs more when I talk about those different conditions. So I just wanted to finish up with some more slides here. You know, my daughter is growing cut flowers for market now. There's just a few of her plants there. But we do try to encourage beneficial insects in the cropping of the annuals. And that can be, you know, there's perennial gardens as well, and there's, she has some annual flowers here. But we also usually bring through maybe about 5% of the crops into full seed production. And what that does is it allows for a floral nectar source and an appropriate habitat for the beneficial insects to thrive. So let me just give a quick example of what that looks like with when we were working with an entomologist down out of the Ag Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. Uh, we were looking at a beneficial insect called Coetzeal glomeratus, which is a parasitic wasp of the cabbage caterpillar. And so that wasp, very small, lays eggs on the caterpillar the larval stage of the wasp eats the caterpillar from the inside. It comes out, spins a little cocoon, pupal stage, which looks a lot like the ones you see on the back of a hornworm. 
and you'll see them on basal cabbage leaves often. You'll see these little cocoons. That's a Coetzea glomeratus. And then the, out of the pupal stage, of course, hatches the wasp. The wasp feeds on flower nectar of the cabbage family. What happens, and we were watching this in the field, we had Coetzea glomeratus pupal stage uh, marked over the winter and the entomologist, and we were monitoring them. And what it looks like is when the collared, I believe they were on, they were on kale, we were monitoring them both. The collared overwintered, came through spring, you know, we had put the Coetzea glomeratus on the collared, or they originally were there. And when the collared came into flower, the Coetzea glomeratus wasp emerged from the pupil cocoon, like to the day, like immediately. As soon as there was a flowering here, we started seeing emergence. And so nature has it perfectly timed that then the Coetzea glomeratus is up feeding on the flower nectar and you know, patrolling the fields for uh, cabbage caterpillar. If we had done in all of the kale and collard in the fall and not let any of it come through to seeding, A, we would have wiped out the habitat on which the actual cocoons lived, and B, there would have been no floral nectar source for the wasp to emerge and consume for its life. So what we noticed over time is that these things are all timed very appropriately by nature. And so we are working with plant species in a co-evolutionary type of situation. They are depending on us to move them forward, just like we're depending on them to move us forward. And so it is probably not appropriate or uh, taking too much from nature to w never allow the crop to come to seed and to be moving its uh, genetic development to its location along with you. So it's, it's a natural arrangement to be bringing that crop to full seed fruition and reseeding that crop. And it is in uh, a natural balance, which then increases the natural balance of the prey predator relationship. So just some overarching concepts there. Obviously, when the, the seed crops come up you know, in the spring, especially a lot of the winter annuals and stuff, they are just loaded with beneficial insects, hoverflies, all kinds of wasps. You know, Very, very obvious that there's tremendous amount of predatory insects on those flowers in the spring and all season long. You know, Classic good crops to bring through for <coughs> uh, beneficial insects are the, the cabbage family, brassicas. Anything in the umbiliferous family also does really well. But pretty much, you know, anything that's not a wind-pollinated crop, you know, really good for bringing through a lot of beneficial insects. 